One summer, we were serving at the park at a community event that happens every year. And it was early on in the life, in the beginning of our, of our church. And we were handing out bottles of water. We were handing out granola bars to serve our neighbors. And an older lady came to me, and she began asking about the church. And so we had this great conversation and exchange. But then she began to ask questions about the day that we worshipped. And it got awkward. You see, she was of a particular faith persuasion that saw the primary day of worship and rest as Saturday. And in her mind, there was no reconciling the Sabbath was a Saturday and therefore should be the day of worship and rest. She said it had to be Saturday. After all, isn't that what the Bible teaches? Isn't that the day that the Jews worshipped? I mean, even Jesus himself, he went to the synagogue on Saturdays. That was his Shabbat or Sabbath. So why would you call yourself a follower of Jesus and worship on a Sunday? Don't you want to honor God and His Word? What would you say in response to someone like that? It went from this pleasant exchange and excitement about a new church coming to the neighborhood to a theological debate on which day is the right day to worship. Well, what I shared with her was actually what we're going to read today um, in today's passage. I quoted to her the words of Jesus. And her response was, wait, what? The Bible says that? Where? In other words, she had so adamantly defended her supposed biblical stance on Sabbath and yet never read the words of Jesus on the matter. Now we're in Mark chapter 2 and we've already seen a series of debates, as it were, between the religious leaders and Jesus. First, it was a debate on Jesus' ability to forgive sin. And then they argued about Jesus befriending tax collectors and sinners. They questioned how Jesus and his disciples could go about feasting instead of fasting like all the other good, holy, righteous, religious people. And today, as we reach the end of chapter 2 of Mark, a fourth debate is going to arise. Remember that in the previous verses, Jesus describes how he is bringing new wine. In other words, Jesus is ushering in something new. The Pharisees not only struggled to understand this, but they also pushed back against this new work that Jesus is doing. As we continue reading, now the Pharisees are going to push against Jesus, His disciples, and the Sabbath. And so if you have your Bibles or you're following King Jesus journals, turn to Mark chapter 2, starting at verse 23. On the Sabbath, He was going through the grain fields, and His disciples began to make their way, picking some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to Him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Mark makes it clear that it's a Sabbath. In other words, it's Saturday. And Jesus and his disciples are walking through some grain fields and the disciples pick some heads of grain. And this was essentially picking at the grain in order just to get themselves a snack. But when the Pharisees see them, they accuse them of breaking the law of the Sabbath. And the argument they were making is that on the Sabbath, you're not supposed to work. But yet here are the disciples walking through the grain fields and they're picking grain so that they could snack. The Pharisees were making reference to a command given by God to the Jewish people that was a part of the Ten Commandments. In fact, uh, you can read this for yourself. It's found in Exodus chapter 34. You are to labor six days, but, uh, but you must rest on the seventh day. You must even rest during plowing and harvesting times. You see, there it goes. The Word of God commands it. And here are the disciples, by the way, with Jesus right beside them, under His supervision, allowing them on the Sabbath to break a commandment. Right? Well, you have to ask yourself the question, were they plowing and harvesting? The answer is no, of course not. They were grabbing a snack on the way to wherever they were going. You can hardly equate that to plowing and harvesting. In fact, did you know that in the law, there was a provision to do exactly what the disciples were doing? That's right. You can read it for yourself in Deuteronomy chapter 23. When you enter your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck heads of grain with your hand, but do not put a sickle to your neighbor's grain. But yet for these Pharisees, as they have Jesus and the disciples under the microscope of their religious worldview, they accuse the disciples of breaking the Sabbath. And if, and if they're breaking the Sabbath under Jesus' watch, then Jesus must not be a trustworthy source. You see, the Pharisees were infamous for taking the law and adding on to it. They would take what was written and take it to an extreme because if they were to complete and follow it to such a standard, it meant that they were all the more righteous and pious and holy. And so 
This is the first big idea I'd like for us to gather from the text here. And you can write this down in your notes if you'd like under number one. Religion seeks to add on to the law. The Pharisees were extremely religious to a fault. They would take the law and the commands of God and add on to it to create a near impossible standard of living. And you know what? If we're not careful, we can do the same thing. We too can follow the patterns of the Pharisees and the religious leaders of Jesus' day, creating a standard that is not only impossible, but unbiblical. The term that we use to describe this is legalism. The Pharisees were extremely legalistic in their teaching, customs, and way of living. And it's evidence here as the disciples are grabbing a snack, but being accused of harvesting on the Sabbath. What is legalism? One definition is this. It's focusing on the text of written law to the exclusion of the intent of the law, elevating strict adherence to law over justice, mercy, grace, and common sense. Right? It's looking to keep the letter of the law without examining the intent of that particular law. As we continue reading, Jesus is going to get to the heart of this particular law, in this case, the Sabbath. In other words, he's going to share God's intent behind the Sabbath. But legalism is a threat and a, tempta and a temptation for many of us because most of us want to believe that we can somehow earn God's favor through our actions. And if we're a good enough person, if we're a really good rule keeper, in fact, if we go above and beyond even what the rules say, then we can be in right standing with God. But this legalistic way of thinking actually becomes a burden that God never intended for us to carry. You know, I love what one author writes in an article about legalism. He says this, check this out. Legalism is the lie that God will find more pleasure in me because of my obedience, because my obedience is greater than others, or that God looks at me with disgust because I am not growing in grace as quickly as my friends. It is the failure to remember that God's pleasure in us comes outside of us in Christ. Legalism causes the heart to forget that God sings over us because of the work He has done, not because of what we have done. And so here the Pharisees holding this religious legalistic weight over the heads of the disciples, and they think that they have Jesus cornered. By the way, notice how they present the accusation. They present it in a question versus a statement. In other words, it's like they're saying, oh, you know, I'm just asking an innocent question. I'm just, I'm just curious, could you scratch my theological itch about this particular issue? But what is underlying the question is accusation and condemnation. It's saying to Jesus and the disciples that they do not live up to the righteous standard that the true religious elite people do. And so how does Jesus respond? Well, similar to his response in the, verse, in the verses before, Jesus responds to their question with a story. But this time, he's going to share a story from the Bible, from the book that these religious leaders should be experts on. And so he goes on to say this. He said to them, Have you never read what David and those who were with him did when he was in need and hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests, and also gave some to his companions. Jesus takes a page from the book of 1 Samuel. And in case you've never read the story, I'll try to summarize it for you. you know, God had commanded that there would be what was called the bread of the presence. And it was actual bread that was placed on a table inside of the tabernacle. And this bread was a sign of a covenant with God, with, with God as, a, as a promise that He was among His people. No one could eat the bread except a specific group of Levite priests. However, in Samuel, David is running for his life with his group of men. And the, the current king Call is in red hot and jealous pursuit of David. So David arrives at the high priest and is starving, but there's no food for them. So what happens? The priest allows David and his men to eat the bread. Now, why is Jesus sharing this story? Because he's trying to make a point. It was against God's command to eat the bread of the presence. But with David's life on the line, the next anointed king of Israel, he's permitted to eat the bread. A person's life is more important than the specific rule that was instituted. And this is what Jesus is trying to communicate to the Pharisees by using this example. He quotes from a passage that they, as religious leaders, would have known very well to get this message across. And what he's trying to communicate is this, number two in your notes, if you're writing notes today, you can write this down. Sabbath was a blessing, not a burden. 
Sabbath was instituted by God as a gift to mankind. It was never meant to be a burden. It was never meant to be a religious noose to hang over the necks of people. But yet this is exactly what the Pharisees had turned it into. They turned what was supposed to be a gift into a religious chore. And while Jesus could have addressed their beef with the disciples directly by correcting their false and overly legalistic take on Sabbath, instead, he addresses God's overarching intention with instituting the command to begin with. And with this, he's trying to reveal to the Pharisees the heart of God, which is to care for his people. God cares for us so deeply that he includes within the commands a day of worship and rest, But the Pharisees had turned it into something else entirely so as to wear their obedience to the law as a badge of honor around their neck. You know, guys, if we're not careful, we too can fall into the trap of the Pharisees creating rules for people that weigh them down as opposed to pointing them to the immense amount of freedom that we now have in Christ. Instead of pointing them to the great love of God. You see, Christ is that new wine. And with his arrival, with his life, death, and resurrection, we have the ultimate fulfillment of the law. The purpose of the law was to reveal to us how holy and righteous God is and to show us how incredibly short we fall before him. The law serves as a mirror to reveal our sinfulness and to hopefully open our eyes to how gracious and mighty and merciful God is in sending Jesus who lived and fully satisfied the laws and his requirements for us. As a sinless man, Jesus was led to the cross where he would die in the place of guilty sinners. This is what we call the atonement, that on the cross he would take on the sin debt that we owed and absorb the wrath of God. And then three days later, he would conquer the grave, which would loosen the grip of Satan's sin and death. And now for all who would look to Jesus, not to the law, but to him, we can have forgiveness of sin. We can have newness of life. Christ's righteousness is transferred over to us, but it requires that faith in him. And so the law is no longer binding on us because Jesus has fulfilled it and given us freedom. And this is why Paul would write to the Galatians these words, Before this faith came, we were confined under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith was revealed. The law then was our guardian until Christ so that we could be justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For through faith, we are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. This is part of the new work that Jesus came to do. And now for all who put their faith in Jesus, not in one's own work or ability to uphold the law, but faith in Jesus and his perfect work, we can become children of God. Our sins are forgiven and our lives are made new. Now, there's one more mic drop that Jesus is going to share with the Pharisees about the Sabbath. It's going to confirm what we've mentioned so far, but it's also going to reveal some important information about himself. Let's read verses 27 and 28. Then he told them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So then the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now, you have to love how Jesus phrases this here, right? Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, man was not created to appease the Sabbath. The Sabbath was created to serve man. The Pharisees had gotten it twisted, but here Jesus makes it plain for them and helping them understand God's intent behind the Sabbath. And it was not what the religious leaders had turned it into. But then he shares why. He can make this statement and by which authority he has to interpret this command. You can write this down in your notes on the number three, and that is this, that the king is Lord of the Sabbath. You know, one of his most favorite ways to refer to himself was by the title Son of Man. And this title refers to Christ's humanity. But then he follows that up with the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. What was Jesus saying? You know, once again, we see another clear indication of who Jesus is claiming to be. Is he a teacher? Is he a prophet? Is he a miracle worker? Or is there more to Jesus? Is he someone greater? And Jesus makes it abundantly clear to the Pharisees, to anyone who is present, and to all of us here today that he is Lord. And the reason he can speak so authoritatively on the subject of Sabbath is because he is the Lord and even Lord of the Sabbath. If Son of Man was a clear call to His humanity, Lord of the Sabbath is an absolutely clear call to His divinity. 
This speaks to the nature of who Jesus is, 100% God, 100% man. And since he is God in flesh, he has every right and authority to teach what God's heart and intention behind that Sabbath is. And what the Sabbath should ultimately point us to is a greater rest that Jesus claims to offer. You see, the Sabbath is simply a shadow, a snapshot of why the King is among us. It was because He desired to bring not simply a physical rest to our bodies, but a spiritual rest to our souls. Jesus is our Sabbath rest. And this is why Jesus would say these words, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, for those of you that are bogged down by the impossible weight of religion, for those of you that are weighed down by life and circumstances, Jesus says to come to Him and you will find rest. This is what Jesus offers. This is what Sabbath points us to. And ultimately what it should lead us to is to ask this question. Is He the Lord of your life? Stop trying to live up to an impossible standard or make or, or made up standard, whether placed by you or someone around you. Submit and surrender to Jesus. And when you do, you will find rest for your souls in Him. Thank you, Jesus, that you are Lord of the Sabbath. You are King. Thank you that you have provided a rest for our thirsty and weary souls. For those yet to do so, would you reveal yourself as Lord to them, that they might come to see you in all your fullness and glory. Thank you for the blessing of Sabbath rest, for giving us opportunities to rest our bodies, to find, to find pleasure in your creation, to find enjoyment in a ceasing from labor. Lord, would you keep us from falling into a religion which attempts us to put us at the center, a religion that weighs us down and weighs others down, one that makes us tired and burdened and weary. And instead, might we live our lives in light of the freedom of Christ and the truth of God's Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.